Hello, you too. Wayman29 tagged me to mention a book which made me so angry I threw it. If I had a physical copy of this book, I probably would have thrown it, but I only have an audiobook. This is Erasing Hell, What God Said About Eternity and the Things We Made Up by Francis Chan and Preston Sprinkle. Now, before I get into the evidence which Chan presents to support his position, I'd like to mention a couple of items from the Statement of Faith of Eternity Bible College. Chan is the chancellor and founder of this Bible college, would have had to approve the items in this statement, and the content of the book affirms these items. We believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, the 66 canonical books, to be the verbally inspired Word of God, the final authority for faith and life, inerrant in the original writings, infallible and in God-breathed. God has divinely preserved the Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew texts so as to make His will explicitly known and obeyed. This conviction requires a literal, historical, and grammatical interpretation to the totality of Scripture. Additionally, we believe that after death, the souls of unbelievers remain in conscious misery until the second resurrection, when they shall appear at the great white throne judgment, and shall be cast into the lake of fire, not to be annihilated, but to suffer everlasting conscious punishment. And I'd also like to mention a statement made in an interview which was attached to the audiobook. So this is a statement made by the person conducting the interview, although Chan gave his assent to this statement. And I think it, again, articulates the position being taken here. You had to sort out what was fiction or tradition from what the scripture really teaches, what God has told us about this topic. So again, you have the idea reiterated that the words of the Bible were literally dictated by God to the people who wrote them down. So let's continue with the evidence he presents from the Hebrew Bible regarding the doctrine of hell. So in chapter 2, uh, Chan states the following. The doctrine of hell was progressively developed throughout Scripture, much like heaven, the Holy Spirit, and even Jesus. So I can already see the rhetoric being employed here. So because heaven, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus are unassailable doctrines, uh, which I am asserting were progressively developed, just like the doctrine of hell, don't you dare touch this doctrine. He also says, um, that definitely does not mean that these things changed over time. God simply revealed more and more about them as Scripture unfolds. Okay, uh, he then provides various citations from the book of Genesis and the book of Isaiah, which state that the righteous go to a place called Sheol after death. So I'll provide links to these citations. He then provides citations from the books of Numbers and Isaiah, which state that the wicked go to Sheol as well. Chan then asserts, still, this doesn't mean that they go to the same place. It only means that the word Sheol is flexible and doesn't have to designate the specific destiny of the righteous or wicked. Chan continues, at the very least, Sheol is just a synonym for death. At most, it may refer to some sort of shadowy, subhuman existence after death without specifying the details. The Old Testament doesn't give us many details about hell. Daniel 12.2 says that the wicked will be resurrected and punished, but no other details are given. It's not until the New Testament that these ideas are fully revealed. Um, how is moving from a synonym for death to a dualistic afterlife a progression of ideas? Uh, they seem to be diametrically opposed positions, uh, which I'm going to attempt to illustrate with some citations from the Old Testament. So let's see if the hypothesis regarding the progressive revelation of the doctrine of hell throughout Scripture 
uh, can be falsified. I'm going to read from the book of Ecclesiastes first, and like Chan does later in this chapter, I'm going to provide some approximate dating for the writings of these books. So Ecclesiastes written between the 4th to 3rd century BCE. This is an evil in all that happens under the sun, that the same fate comes to everyone. Moreover, the hearts of all are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But whoever is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, and even the memory of them is lost. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. Never again will they have any share in all that happens under the sun. Go, eat your bread with enjoyment, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Then let's read from Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. This was written in the mid-2nd century BCE. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Does this seem like a logical, gradual progression of ideas? They seem to be diametrically opposed positions. One of these writers believes in an afterlife and a resurrection of the dead, and the other does not. Let's read from another Old Testament passage which affirms the doctrine of resurrection. This is from 2 Maccabees chapter 7, verses 20-23. through 23. Uh, This was written in the late 2nd century BCE. The mother was especially admirable and worthy of honorable memory. Although she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, she bore it with good courage because of her hope in the Lord. She encouraged each of them in the language of their ancestors. Filled with a noble spirit, she reinforced her woman's reasoning with a man's courage, and said to them, I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set in order the elements within each of you. Therefore, the creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of humankind and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. Now, let's go to another Old Testament passage, which, like Ecclesiastes, denies the existence of life after death. From the book of Sirach, chapter 14, verses 11 through 19. Now, this was originally written in Hebrew in the early 2nd century BCE, but then was finally edited in Greek in the late 2nd century BCE. My child, treat yourself well according to your means, and present worthy offerings to the Lord. Remember that death does not tarry, and the decree of Hades has not been shown to you. So Hades is the Greek cognate of Sheol. Do good to friends before you die, and reach out and give to them as much as you can. Do not deprive yourself of a day's enjoyment. Do not let your share of desired good pass by you. Will you not leave the fruit of your labors to another, and what you acquired by toil to be divided by lot? Give and take and indulge yourself, because in Hades one cannot look for luxury. All living beings become old like a garment, for the decree from of old is, you must die like abundant leaves on a spreading tree that sheds some and puts forth others, so are the generations of flesh and blood. One dies and another is born. Every work decays and ceases to exist, and the one who made it all will pass away with it. I know that Chan is not going to accept that 2nd Maccabees and Sirach 
are divinely inspired and thus divinely dictated. However, I believe that quoting from them is appropriate because, um, restating Chan's assertion, it's not until the New Testament that these ideas regarding hell are fully revealed that his own research indicates otherwise and that these ideas originated in Jewish writings which he certainly wouldn't consider to be divinely inspired. Now, he provides some proof texts from contemporary Jewish literature to prove the following three points. One, hell is a place of punishment after judgment. Two, hell is described in imagery of fire and darkness where people lament. Three, hell is a place of annihilation or never-ending punishment. So, I'm not going to read all of these citations, although I will provide them all in the description. However, these citations come from 2nd Esdras, also known as 4th Ezra, from the 1st century CE, 1st Enoch, from the 2nd century BCE, 1st century BCE, and 1st century CE, Pseudo Philo, from the 1st century CE, 2nd Enoch, from the 1st to 2nd century CE, 2nd Baruch, from the 1st century CE, and 4th Maccabees, from the 1st century CE. There is one specific, somewhat peculiar passage uh, which I'd like to mention uh, because it helps reinforce the point that I want to make regarding the citation of this Jewish literature. Uh, this is something which Chan mentions in the appendix to the book. Uh, this passage is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 20. They read, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. So regarding this passage, Chan has to say, it almost certainly doesn't mean that Jesus was preaching to unbelievers who had died. He then provides references to Genesis 6, 2 Peter 2, 4, and Jude 6, and takes this as a reference to the angels which spawned the Nephilim. Now, I'd like to read uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, um, because it, it states it in a little more detail than Jude 6. Um, something interesting of note here would be um, that critical scholars believe that the author of 2 Peter actually used the epistle of Jude in order to write this. So, 2 Peter says, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus, and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, let's read the passage from Genesis 6, which refers to the angels which spawned the Nephilim. This is from Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans, who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. And this is the only passage in the Hebrew Bible which provides background information regarding the Nephilim and the sons of God, their progenitors. So where does this tradition 
regarding them being put into prison come from, which Tan believes this is referring to. This comes from the book of First Enoch, of course. Let me read from First Enoch chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. In those days when the children of man had multiplied, it happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves from among the daughters of man, and beget us children. And Semyaz, being their leader, said unto them, I fear that perhaps you will not consent that this deed should be done, and I alone will become responsible for this great sin. But they all responded to him, Let us all swear an oath and bind everyone among us by a curse not to abandon this suggestion, but to do the deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another by the curse. And they were all together two hundred, and they descended into Ardos, which is the summit of Hermon. And they called the Mount Armon, for they swore and bound one another by a curse. And also from First Enoch chapter 21, verses 7 through 10. I then proceeded from that area to another place, which is even more terrible, and saw a terrible thing, a great fire that was burning and flaming. The place had a cleavage that extended to the last sea, pouring out great pillars of fire. Neither its extent nor its magnitude could see nor was able to estimate. At that moment, what a terrible opening is this place and a pain to look at. Then Uael, one of the holy angels who was with me, responded and said to me, Enoch, why are you afraid like this? I answered and said, I am frightened because of this terrible place and the spectacle of this painful thing. And he said unto me, This place is the prison house of the angels. They are detained here forever. Very interesting. Very interesting. So it seems that ideas from First Enoch have directly shown up in the New Testament. You know, just like the proof texts which were provided for certain hell doctrines uh, which appear in the New Testament, uh, which showed up in other contemporary Jewish literature. And um, with the exception of Fourth Maccabees and Pseudo Philo, all of these apocalyptic writings are pseudonymous works written hundreds of years after the authors purportedly lived. This would include Daniel, of course. So if we're going to look at things in the uh, black and white way uh, in which Tan wants us to do, we could say that the authors lied by pretending to be someone who they weren't. And additionally, um, while 4th Ezra is considered canonical by the Russian Orthodox Church and 1st Enoch by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, none of the other books are considered canonical by either Christianity or Judaism. Going back to chapter 2, you know, Chan describes this as this Jewish world is the one Jesus grew up in. And additionally, he mentions, uh, Jesus' unqualified references to Gehenna would have been taken to mean the same thing unless he specified that he had something else in mind. So given that, um, what is the more likely scenario? Uh, that God dictated to Jesus and the New Testament writers ideas which just so happened to be circulating in Jewish writings which are now considered authoritative by no one? or that Jesus and these writers used ideas which were common to them. Chan explodes his concept of biblical exceptionalism by the very evidence which he provides to support his position regarding the doctrine of hell. And that's one reason why I wanted to throw the book. 
I may make another video regarding uh, the Calvinist doctrines, which he asserts in this book as fact, uh, which made me want to throw the book as well. Um, but this is it for now.